UPI is killing it. In the last couple of years, it's been called one of the biggest revolutions in India's digital journey. UPI, India's very own digital payments platform, takes the position of pride. If I look at the case of India, it is actually quite impressive. It's a logistical marvel. Going forward, everyone will benefit from India's growth story. UPI Jalega. Now, the government of India is taking UPI global. More than 20 countries already accept cross-border UPI payments, and it's quickly becoming an incredible source of soft power for India. The big highlights of this visit is the UPI. It's been introduced in France. Japan has expressed interest in joining the country's UPI payment system. And so in today's debate, Pankaj and I are going to be unpacking UPI, India's fintech revolution, to try to understand some of its international competition, as well as the future potential that this incredible piece of digital infrastructure has. But before we go there, let's set a little bit of context here because obviously UPI did not happen in a bubble and it's actually part of a much larger movement called India Stack. Yeah, so India Stack is one of my favorite topics to talk about. And I think of it as a set of digital infrastructures which would allow India to leap forward in this digital age in sectors like finance, health, or education, right? And to sort of understand where this India stack came from, how it was born, we have to go a little back in history. So let's start from 1991. So India was a closed economy till 1991. And that means that the government decided everything about the economy, who will produce what, and even what price can they sell it at. But this dream of socialism, it came crashing down in 91, when India was on the verge of bankruptcy. And so our government was forced to open up the economy to international investors. This resulted in FDI coming to India increase 50 times in just four years, from $132 million in 91 to $5.3 billion in 1995. And India's GDP grew as well. It was just $270 billion in 1991, and it doubled to $500 billion by 2000, and then again doubled to $1 trillion by 2006. But there was a problem. All this growth was only benefiting rich people. People who already had the resources just became more rich. I think you call them like uh, in India, crore parties, right? More like Arab parties. There was a term that became popular during this time, billionaire Raj, meaning the rule of billionaires. And there was a very simple reason behind this. The rich had easy access to capital and they can take loans more easily while poor people did not have that option. And this led to a rise of income inequality among Indians. And it started to feel like that the entire opening up of economy was only benefiting the already rich. And so there was a big challenge in front of Indian government, financial inclusion. And the government took many steps to sort of address that. And one of the most important, or I would say the first step that Indian government took was Manarega, which is basically an employment guarantee act for rural people. And the main objective of this was to give money directly into the bank accounts of the people. But there were big challenges. Firstly, in 2009, most Indians did not have a bank account. For example, only 20% Indians in 2009 had a bank account. But let's say even if government opens bank account for all these people, there was no way to identify the owners of these bank accounts. So that's when government came up with an ambitious plan, giving digital identity to every Indian. And that's how in 2009, Aadhaar was born. Sort of the first puzzle piece for the entire India stack. Yeah, and I think for people who are watching this video outside of India, they might not fully understand the significance of India stack and more specifically Adhar, because outside of India, at least where I'm from, we have something called SIN cards, social insurance number cards. In the United States, they have social security cards. And so this is just a common thing, right? Having a central definitive source of ID, whereas India at that time, people had driver's licenses, they had voter IDs, they had all kinds of identification, but it was mainly secondary identification, right? Not primary identification. And so the the problem is that when the internet came along, countries like mine and countries like the United States, they were able to move their entire offline central database onto the internet, right? But India didn't really have such a database, so they couldn't actually move it online. And this was a big problem. And so I think one of the big reasons why Adhar was seen as so ambitious is they actually wanted to leapfrog all of these other countries. They wanted to go from having literally no database, not even an offline database of everybody's identification, to going to a complete database and moving that entirely online, which was a massive step, a very difficult and challenging thing to implement. And so then when people have this form of of central ID, this Adhar card, they can go out and actually get all of these other things. Like you talked about bank accounts, they can get PAN cards, they can get voters IDs, driver's licenses. I mean, everything can start from Adhar. And this is actually where we move on to the next step, because as you're moving into the digital age, people are getting mobile phones, right? And you can actually start linking phone numbers 
to Adhar cards, which is something that is still kind of behind, at least where I'm from in Canada, people, the government hasn't really figured that out. So the phone number is not necessarily linked to your identity as a person the same way that it is here in India. In fact, the Canadian government, I think, typically links your email address because we had that sort of that moment back in the 90s and early 2000s when email ID was the number one form of online identification, whereas India, it's definitely mobile numbers, right? Everybody's getting OTPs, whereas where I'm from, OTPs aren't really that big of a deal. And so when you connect all the dots here, what you end up with is the central form of ID in Adhar. You have people who have mobile numbers, you have people with bank accounts, and you can actually connect all three of those things and create this robust, incredible digital infrastructure. Yeah, exactly. And as government solved this identity problem, problem for every Indian, then they looked at the next big issue, which is basically making payments. And that's how UPI was born. But even before UPI, there was something called IMPS, basically immediate payment system. And although it was fast and settled payments in real time, it wasn't easy to use. You could only make payments through your bank's app or website, and you needed all these things like username, password, bank account number, IFSC code, which wasn't really seamless. Yeah, if it was me back then, I would have just used cash, right? And I think also there's this thing, network effects that comes into play, right? The way that social media works, that you would only use it if your friend is using it. It's the same way with digital payments, right? If you're using digital payments and I'm using digital payments, then maybe we're gonna transact through digital payments, but most people at that time were using cash. But was that the only peer-to-peer -peer payment system in India at that time? No, there are other options like NEFT and RTGS, but IMPS was the only one which was settling payments in real time. But as we discussed, there was no user friendliness in those app. And this was around the same time when wallets like Paytm and phone pay were getting really popular. And this taught the government that these apps, these startups, they are better suited to bring people online, right? They had this attractive UI UX, they had network effect, but the security of the banking had to be maintained. So there should be a way to decouple payments from banks and give it to these apps. And that was the idea behind UPI, right? It launched in April of 2016. Around the same time, a bigger, I would say, revolution that was taking place in India, Geo. So Geo gave everyone these free SIM cards, these 4G cards, and now people had unlimited data so they could download any app that they wanted to make payments. Yeah, I was actually, I first shifted to India back in 2017, and I remember this happening. I wasn't aware of, uh, of why or how it was happening. Airtel and all these other telecommunications companies, they had to stay competitive, otherwise they would go out of business. So they had to suddenly lower their costs significantly to keep their customers around. And I think it was around the same time, I remember traveling across the country end of 2017, 2017 and looking around and seeing all of these Paytm stickers on any any food cart at any restaurant they were there people were offering these QR codes and so I thought that was pretty cool I loaded up my Paytm wallet I was using it on a regular basis and then I think I, I remember towards the end of 2018 or 2019 was the first time that I tested out phone pay specifically and I completely abandoned Paytm like the next day. I had a bunch of money in my Paytm wallet. I didn't even care. I just left it there. I didn't even want to use that app anymore because it was so much more convenient to just link my bank account to this UPI app. And then I never had to worry about loading up a digital wallet ever again. So at that time, the convenience factor was instantly apparent to me. Yeah, and you had come from Canada at that time. What is the difference between, let's say something like Google Pay, Phone Pay, compared to the options that you had in Canada? <laughs> I, like I, <laughs> there's like nothing in Canada. We're, we're back in the stone age. Okay. Maybe that's an exaggeration, but I think it was around 2016, 2017 that people started to really use Apple pay. Uh, and when I say really started to use it was mainly just people using iPhones, right? Which isn't the entire population. I think people were still transitioning from Blackberry to iPhone at that time. Um, but it was starting to gain popularity. But I think the most popular option for digital payments at that time in Canada and probably in the United States as well was PayPal, which is very similar to Paytm in that you have to, of course, load up your digital wallet, but it's mainly desktop oriented. It's not really for mobile payments. You're not gonna go out and see a PayPal QR code, but at least in Canada, I would say the leader at that time period and probably still to this day, a lot of people are using this technology on a regular basis. It's called Interac. And like I mentioned earlier, email, at least in Canada, is a very significant part of our digital identity. And so the way that Interact works is that you make a transaction through your banking app or your banking website, and you send it to a person's email address, and then they will receive that email. They'll have to open the email, they'll have to click accept, then they'll have to plug in some password and basically approve the payment into their account. It's really clunky, it's really old fashioned. It's not anywhere near as quick and streamlined as UPI. So it's kind of similar to the way 
way that you described IMPS, but I think one of the big differences between Interac and really a lot of the digital payments infrastructure in the world right now is that in India, all of this innovation is happening in the public sector, right? This is government infrastructure, whereas in Canada, United States, even China, all of the innovation is happening in the private sector. Companies are the ones that are actually building these apps, these websites, these solutions for people to actually make digital payments. And there's some differences between that private sector innovation and public sector innovation that I want to go into. So let's specifically look at China now, because I think they're kind of the closest competitor if we're talking about digital payments infrastructure to India. And 2017 was the beginning of Alipay's pay with face technology becoming a widespread thing. You also had Tencent launching cashless, checkout lists, staff list stores through WeChat in 2017, where customers could just scan a QR code to enter the store, and then they could walk out with whatever they wanted and auto payment would happen instantly. And this idea was actually implemented a little bit earlier on too, and at a very limited scale with Amazon Go. I'm not sure if you ever saw that advertisement for the Amazon Go store. Yeah, I remember seeing YouTube videos about it. People are just walking out without making any payments and it just gets auto deducted from their bank, right? So is that tech still around? Right, yeah, it was a really cool innovation and everybody thought that it was gonna be the future, but to answer your question, no, not really. I don't think that it's very common anywhere in the world right now. It was kind of a fad, the same way that NFTs and crypto seem to have been a fad as well. But one thing that wasn't a fad was the whole pay with face thing, at least in China. People are still using this technology heavily in 2023 because it's just so convenient. Now, I think this is where we will start to diverge a little bit in terms of our opinions and get into a little bit of a debate here because if we compare digital payments infrastructure between China and India, at least back in 2017, the difference is night and day. So I have a source here from nextbillion.net saying, the entire cumulative volume of UPI transactions in the 10 months prior to the end of January 2018 was roughly equivalent to one day's worth of digital transactions in China in 2016 when the People's Bank of China reported 185 billion non-bank digital payment transactions or 12 transactions every month for every one of China's people, which equates to roughly $18 trillion. Well, I think this is largely due to the fact that they are there since a long time. For example, Alipay was started in 2004, like 12 years before UPI was started. So I think mainly it's just that time effect. Yeah, and we're starting to see things change now where UPI is actually getting to the scale, similar scale to some of these Chinese apps. But I think back in 2016, 2017 time period, one of the reasons why these Chinese apps, these companies were able to get so much further ahead than India was actually the government's fault. See, the Chinese government took a very hands-off approach during the development of this sector, allowing private companies like Alibaba and Tencent to build private infrastructure quickly, forming relationships with banks and enabling digital transactions through mobile phones. Whereas in India, this kind of behavior actually wasn't allowed. So you wouldn't really see companies like MobiQuick or Paytm or FreeCharge even trying to set up infrastructure to facilitate bank-to-bank -bank transactions because they weren't allowed to. Instead, they just offered digital wallets, allowing users to store virtual money there and make transactions that way. And like you said earlier, the government of India was trying to set up their own stuff, IMPS, which was just so clunky that people opted to use these digital payment apps like Paytm, for example, instead, because they were so much better than what the government of India was offering. Yeah, you're right. India was late to realize the importance of the entire real-time payments. But once it did, it built the public infrastructure that no other country, including China, could think of, right? So you can see this battle between public companies and private run companies in China. Yeah, you're right. Actually, this is a huge component of this story. The difference between private and public is actually very significant because what you can facilitate with public is very different and I would argue superior to what you can offer through private. So the really incredible thing about UPI is that it is in fact instant. So merchants will receive the money immediately after customers confirm the payment that's written on the NPCI website. And I think we all know this intuitively, right? We've paid at a shop and we've heard the little voice box say, ATM per rupee your payment has gone through, right? Or you'll send money to a friend and they'll just check their phone, they'll get an SMS and they'll see, yep, the money is in my account. Yeah, but is that not how Chinese apps work? 
Yeah, so in China, the payments might happen quickly, but technically they're not instant. And the reason they're not instant is again, because it's private. And so the payment is actually traveling, or at least the request for the payment is traveling through many different channels. It's passing through many different hands before it's approved. And we can actually see this on Alipay's own site. So there are two types of time for a single settlement to be credited to a card, the same day and the next day. And this is for merchants specifically. So for the user, for the customer who's making the payment, it, it appears to be instant. The money leaves their account and they see that the payment has been made. But on the merchant side, this might actually take some time. Why? Well, it's because the stuff that's happening in the back end is very different in China from the way that it's happening in the back end in India with UPI. So I'll just lay it out for you, okay? So with UPI, you have the customer, the merchant, both the banks, and UPI in the middle. And it's the same thing with Chinese digital payment apps like WePay and Alipay, but because UPI is government infrastructure and because banks need to be authorized by the government and because the RBI has relationships with all of these banks, everything happens smoothly. There's basically this underlying government layer, a layer of trust and transparency and authority that runs through the entire process from beginning to end. In China, on the other hand, though, this layer of trust doesn't exist. Each party involved in the transaction is independent. It's private and they're all trying to make money. So the trust needs to be earned every step of the way, which is why it takes a little bit longer for the merchant to get their money. Yeah, exactly. And as we compare UPI with these payment solutions from around the world, we realize how technological superior and efficient UPI is. And although in size and scale, it's much smaller right now because it's very new, I think this tech superiority will allow it to grow much faster and well adopted from like all the other countries. I would, I'll, I'll push back there a little bit because I think you're using that word superiority. And I think in India, if we're looking at a country by country basis, definitely UPI is one of, if not the best digital payments infrastructure in the world right now for Indians, for its local people. But on a global stage, uh, saying that it would be superior to other apps might be a bit contentious because of the way that things are set up. This is again, coming back to private versus public. Government infrastructure works in your own country, but when you try to scale that to other countries, that's where things start to break down. So I wanna take a look now at what these Chinese apps are doing on the international front, specifically WeChat and Alipay. So these two digital payment infrastructure providers are actually vying right now to become the world's most popular digital payments apps, which puts them in direct competition with UPI. So if we look at the global stage right now in terms of digital payments, UPI is actually number five. So it's behind WeChat, it's behind Alipay in terms of transaction volume. It's also behind MasterCard and Visa, which of course are American solutions. And we don't often think of these as digital payments infrastructure, but they absolutely are. So it's actually very, very similar to UPI. You have a user, you have their bank, you have the merchant's bank, you have the merchant. And then in the middle, the facilitator is MasterCard or Visa. And the only real difference here is that we use MasterCard or Visa enabled cards to make these transactions because this whole infrastructure was created before smartphones. So there's a lot of swiping and tapping to pay rather than using QR codes and more digital solutions. But it's all happening online with MasterCard and Visa. These digital payments, even though they're not mobile first, are happening via the internet. So yeah, looking at India Stack's website, UPI is positioned at number five, but I wanna understand how did UPI get to this number five spot? And I'd, I'd also like to explore how UPI could potentially someday go up the ranks as well, because it is the only one of those five that is a piece of government infrastructure. So I'll let you explain that. For sure. So UPI was launched for public in April of 2016, and it was really slow to pick up in the beginning. But I think along the time, there have been various factors which led to its growth to what we see today. And I think the first factor, which I sort of hinted earlier about was Geo. So Geo came around the same time, and it gave people options to download as many apps as they wanted. But still, it was a choice for people at this point, right? I think the real push factor, it came later part of the same year in 2016, November. It was when demonetization happened. And I think this was the time when people were forced to make payments, right? People were forced to take their phones and make these digital payments. And I think if you look at this graph here, which we're showing on screen, and you can see the growth started picking up in 2017, but it really exploded since 2020 when the pandemic came. And I personally witnessed this happening. So I moved to Bangalore in middle of 2020, around the time first lockdown happened. 
and since that time till today i've never visited atm to get cash right so whether it's the auto guy whether it's a coconut water guy on the streets and even beggars i have paid beggars via upi seriously yeah i've paid multiple times to a beggar using upi and i think this would have happened ultimately but covid really accelerated this and this growth wasn't just happening in cities like bangalore or delhi even people in the remotest villages of india were starting to use upi and this meant that by 2022 total digital transactions in india were 2x of china's and more than 10x of the us's and by now other countries also started noticing this success story and bhutan and nepal became the first countries to adopt upi okay when you say bhutan and nepal accepting UPI what are you saying are you saying that people in Nepal and Bhutan are using UPI for their day-to-day -day transactions or are you saying that Indians who are traveling to Bhutan and Nepal can pay for things as tourists in those countries yeah so primarily these countries are integrating UPI into their payment system but the case of Nepal is a little different Nepal has adopted UPI as their main payment infrastructure so it's not just Indians traveling to Nepal it's actually people in Nepal who are using it so primarily these countries are integrating UPI into their already existing payment infrastructure so if you are an Indian or traveling there as a tourist if you have a bank account in India and that is accepted via UPI you can make you don't have to convert your currency into that you know that market's local currency you can just make payment through indian app and those countries have to accept that got it and i think the only exception to that rule would be nepal right yeah so for nepal they have accepted upi as their main payment infrastructure they did not have anything before that so npci has lent them this technology and they are providing them support through a india based company and so people in nepal like local people are actually using upi the same way that local people in india are using upi exactly but for all these other countries whether it's southeast asian countries like malaysia singapore bhutan or these arab or european countries main population which indian government is targeting is indian students and indian tourists right so for like these countries have a sizable indian population and they send these remittances back every month like or every few months and currently they're using options like swift and paypal but when you use these options you have to pay a fee of like 2 to 5% and and sometimes it takes days to process that payments now 2 to 5% may not sound that big amount but like if you are sending money in thousands of dollars or tens of thousands of dollars that becomes really significant right and this is first chunk of demography that indian government is targeting right and this is going to give them that first acceptance into these countries and as more and more people see the benefit and the efficiency that's when we are going to see the real growth this is where i'm going to push back a little bit again because i think you're looking at it from a very optimistic standpoint where step 1 is upi enters these countries as a solution for nris it becomes a solution for indians traveling abroad maybe as tourists or students who want to transact in that country or they want to remit money back to India and this is great i think this is an amazing first step but i don't necessarily think that this is going to translate into step 2 the step 2 that you and i think a lot of other indian people are imagining is going to happen where suddenly upi becomes uh, another mastercard another visa another wechat another alipay right because Unlike those offerings, UPI is not a private offering, right? This is not a private company. This is the government of India building this infrastructure. And so from another country's standpoint, unless you're Nepal, right, and you don't already have an existing solution and you're ready to adopt something new provided by another country, this is going to be seen as a liability. It might be seen as a security risk or a threat to sovereignty even because government of india is going to be looking in and seeing what's going on in your country india can see your transactions it can see what your people spend money on right and that is definitely not going to be something that most countries are going to be ready to accept and by the way too i am aware of the fact that alipay and wechat you can look at it from the same lens where people are going to be a little bit nervous that the chinese government is looking into their transactions as well because even though they're private companies let's be honest right chinese government is still in control of those companies so i i'm noticing that as well um but specifically thinking about competition with mastercard and visa i just don't think upi is on that is on the same level as those two offerings which are private yes you're right upi was developed in india by indian government but i think it's a public good right and there are ways to make sure that how you transfer this public good to other smaller countries in a way that makes those countries feel safe exactly and especially after russia ukraine war 
every country is realizing how important it is to take control of these digital public goods rather than giving it to some Chinese or some American company. And Indian government is helping them in licensing this and taking control of that. So UPI is India's way of telling these governments that they should have sovereignty over their digital goods, right? And this is exactly what Indian government is trying to explain through G20, which is happening right now. And unlike China or America, India is not seen as a country which is going to snoop and steal your data. India is sort of seen as a benign and a soft power, right? And I'm sure that by the end of G20, we'll see more and more countries accepting this. Okay, real debate here for a second. Uh, what's the benefit then? What's the incentive for India to actually offer this infrastructure? Is it financial or is it another form of soft power? There's no benefit. It's just soft power. You're helping other countries to stand on their feet. Well, then I hope that the government of India is successful at G20 in convincing all of these other countries that they're not taking the same approach as China, which is typically very aggressive, invasive, data hungry, and eventually they use their positions to you know, control these countries in ways that these countries don't want to be controlled. Because for me personally, the way I see it, the real opportunity is actually offering this as infrastructure, as opposed to launching apps or being a private company trying to compete in other foreign markets. Like for example, WeChat Pay tried to enter the UPI space in India in 2019. And of course, it didn't work out for them. So in my view, uh, the real opportunity here isn't so much in competing in other countries' markets, because let's be honest, the competition, the countries in those markets are going to understand that market way better than you ever could. WeChat Pay was never going to succeed in India because they just don't understand the Indian market, right? They don't have the feet on the ground to actually make that happen. And I think it's going to be the same thing for UPI. If UPI tries to go into other markets and compete, with local players in those markets, it's not going to work out. So the real play, the real opportunity here, in my opinion, for UPI is to become an infrastructure provider for countries that don't already have a robust digital payments system. For example, like Nepal, I think there's plenty of other countries in the world right now that don't really have a robust system at the moment. And I think UPI's opportunity could be to go to those countries and say, hey, let us build this thing out for you guys. We already have it set up. It's plug and play for the most part. And we're not going to snoop. We're not going to be invasive. Let's, we just want to help you guys out. Offering infrastructure like this in another country offers you a foothold in that country. It offers you influence, right? So if India is able to propagate UPI around the world, then it's going to gain more influence in those countries. The same way that China has with their One Belt, One Road initiative as well, right? Many countries have adopted that. Some of them regret it. Others don't. It really depends on how much corruption is there in that country. And so the only thing, though, is that India really needs to jump on this right now. They need to start spreading UPI quickly because if they don't, I definitely think that China or the US is going to beat them to the punch. And a lot of those nations that would have adopted UPI if an NPCI, and I think uh, NIPL is the international arm of NPCI, if they had gone to those countries earlier, they might have gone with UPI, but then eventually those countries get snatched up by China or the United States. Exactly. You mentioned One Belt, One Road initiative there, where China is building these physical infrastructure, these roads, these bridges and all these 50 plus countries. And I think India has that opportunity to build that digital infrastructure for these countries, not build, at least help them in building that, right? And with India stack, I see our country sort of redefining what free market is, right? Even in a free market, you can't let few public, few private individuals sort of take hold of these necessary infrastructure, right? Imagine someone in your country controlling roads, right? Some private company, you don't want that to happen. And I think same thing as more and more of our services go digital, whether it's e-commerce, which Indian government is trying to do with ONDC. We want governments and their people to take control, right? Not these foreign or even your own like your own national companies right and if i have to make a prediction five ten years down the line i see more and more countries learning from india and developing these digital public infrastructures right and rather than giving some company some private company ownership governments taking ownership of that and then people can build on top of that but this basic infrastructure layer that india has built i see more and more countries adopting that okay well my prediction is not really a prediction it's more of a hope um, as a foreigner and as someone who has seen other foreigners coming into this country and really struggling to integrate or even interact with the digital payments infrastructure like i remember kaya from slidebean came to bengaluru and he couldn't pay for anything because everything was through upi and he was he just didn't even have it right he tried to book a yulu 
uh, scooter and he, and he couldn't ride it because I think you have to scan that QR code with your phone and he couldn't get UPI set up. So my hope would be that the government of India makes UPI accessible to people who don't have an Indian bank account. And maybe that's a pipe dream. I don't know. The bureaucracy and red tape in this country is next level. So I find it hard to imagine a future where someone with a bank account in Canada or in the United States can sign up and start using UPI the same way that someone with a bank account with HDFC or ICICI Bank can do. But I'd love to see that happen because the day that that happens, UPI becomes something that can be adopted globally, where even a, an offering like Venmo, for example, in the United States, you can actually pay through UPI using that app or some, something to that effect, right? I think that would be incredible. I'd love to see that. Um, if anyone over there at, uh, I don't know why that hasn't already happened. Um, I think that's the way to expand UPI. It's not to go to these countries and form partnerships and, and offer it to NRIs and this whole remit, remittance thing. Um, just offer UPI as a, as a global digital service, the way that anyone in any country can use PayPal, right? It should be set up the same way. And the basic info, it maybe it can be a different version, right? Obviously UPI is very robust and it's the, in its current form, it only really works in the way that it's been set up where there's these partnerships with all these banks and everybody agrees that UPI is the sort of de facto digital payments infrastructure. But if there's like sort of a UPI light or a UPI global or UPI international version that anyone can use in any country and you know, slowly but surely banks around the world and also digital payments apps around the world will start to adopt this, then I think that's where you have the same kind of, like people always wonder why does India not have its own Facebook? Why does India not have its own YouTube, right? Like why, why was India so late? Why is there no Indian iPhone, right? Technology doesn't come from India, right? SaaS comes from India, but when it comes to consumer facing technology that everybody uses on a daily basis, like you and I both have Mac, MacBooks in front of us, right? We're not using some, Bharat book, right? And I feel like UPI could be the first thing like that, where the rest of the world is just completely reliant upon this technology that's coming out of India. So that's my hope, but uh, I'm not that optimistic about it. Realistically, it's... No, that's great. But I think that's our hopes and we'll see what happens. So let us know what do you think of this important topic, I'd say, in the comments down below and see you. Yeah, see ya.